Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Every kibitzing episode is really fun for me, but this one is gonna be really cool. With me today is Murray Horwitz, a playwright, a lyricist, and a broadcaster. Um, you're gonna learn a lot about a lot of things. Welcome, Murray. Thank you so much for taking time to kibitz with me today. You are more than welcome. I, you know, I've never seen a microphone I don't like, and to share it with you is just is fabulous. So thanks a million. Thank you. So we have a ton to cover. Um, I'm going to start a little bit sequentially here. You were born in Ohio and went to Kenyon College. Were either of your parents or any of your or siblings or anything, was anyone else in the arts in your childhood or what theater? A, what a good way to start, uh, because yes and no. Um, nobody was a professional. Uh, my paternal grandfather, whom I never knew, was an artist. He was a sculptor. But both of my parents were performers. My dad was a very, who was a physician, was a very good amateur violinist. My mom was a very good amateur pianist. They made beautiful music together. Nice. Um, and, and, but they exposed my brothers and me to just a wonderful range of, th I mean, we, yes, we went to the Dayton Philharmonic Orchestra and heard Zeno Franciscati and Isaac Stern. And yes, we'd go, my mother would take me to the Cincinnati Opera, which was in the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, wow. But also we got to see, I mean, they took, they took my brother John and me to see Dave Brubeck and Louis Armstrong in 1960 in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got to see Broadway shows on tour. It was just, Nothing was kind of off limits. I mean, they weren't crazy about rock and roll, but, you know, we got that by osmosis, if nothing sure. else. So sure. we got a, a great, you know, went to museums, went to, I mean, the arts were important in That's our house. Fantastic. So you started your career, not so much in the arts, but in the circus. Your family was- That is, circus is an art form. Okay, Don't... circus is an art form. So coolest thing ever. So you were with Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus as a clown for like about three years. That's exactly right. Yeah, so, 1970, 71, and 72, right after, right out of college. So tell me what that was like, and were your parents dismayed that like this is what we you know paid for you to go to college, or how did that? No, I, again, they were great. They okay. they were. What happened was I in my senior year at Kenyon College. Um, for a senior project, I went to the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Clown College and then did a one man show of all kinds of comic characters, including clowning. Um, and when I wanted to take five weeks out of my senior year in college as a, how shall I phrase it, dreadful student, I mean, I was like, mm -hmm. I had a C average at, at best. Okay. Um, my, parent, my parents were concerned about that. And, and my mom took the lead. And um, the, the best story about that is she said, okay, she said, I want to talk to my, my dad, who was wonderful, but who was a sexist said, okay, Charlotte, I always make the decisions. You make this one. Mom said, sure. And she said, I want to talk to his brothers. And my one brother was in the air force in Taiwan. That was not easy to do in 1969. Uh, another brother was a physician who was in Baltimore at that point. Huh. And I, um, and so mom said, I want to talk to his teachers and his administrators. And when she talked to the provost of Kenyon College, the British Dean uh, Haywood, she said, um, he, he argued against my, my going because the four-year liberal arts experience was sacred and inviolate. And you should yes. stay at Kenyon yes. College. Yes. Didn't believe in going away. Didn't even like foreign study for foreign language majors. And uh, mom, this will show you how brilliant my mother was. She said, well, let me ask you this, Dr. Haywood. If it was your boy, what would you do? He said, well, I, I wouldn't send him as a, I, for the reasons I've outlined. And she said, well, if Murray was your boy, what would you do? He said, I'd send him in a minute. So, <laughs> so my parents were very supportive. And in fact, after I got offered a contract, with the Ringling Show. I went back and finished my degree okay. and actually joined the Ringling Show in the middle of the tour in, in Ju July 4th, 1970 in Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin. Did but you when I a... went back, sorry. sorry. Oh, go ahead, when you went back. Well, I, I, I wasn't sure when I went back around Thanksgiving time and to resume my studies and be home for Thanksgiving, 
Uh, I didn't think I was going to join the circus, but not only my friends, that was predictable enough, but my teachers and my family were saying, go, you get to go around the United States and, and get paid for making people laugh and you got out of the draft. You don't need to worry about that. Sure, go. Wow. Wow. And so everybody was really supportive. Huh. Um, best clown story. Did you have a oh stick? God. Did you have like, what was your, what was your thing? But I, we have there so was, much to cover. So just tell us. Yeah, about no, 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 no. There was, <laughs> there, there are many circus stories that can't be told in mixed company on <laughs> a podcast, but um, you know, it was, I was what's called a producing clown because I used to write the gags and okay. get other clowns to, to, to participate in them. Um, but I, and I was also known as a production clown. So in other words, I was not, um, I didn't have a specialty. I wasn't acrobatic, particularly I fell down pretty well. Um, I didn't juggle. I didn't walk wires. I didn't do anything like that, but I would, I just did gags. I was out there to get laughs. Okay. And uh, two shows a day, three three shows on Saturday, and in in retrospect, the best part of the circus was that, because I have now performed before literally millions of people live, and if you want to learn how audiences respond and yeah. how to time things and just how to have a conversation with the audience yeah. in pantomime, uh, there's nothing better than the circus. There used to be places like vaudeville, burlesque, even right. lots of touring theater. That doesn't exist anymore. And there's not, not a lot of places for, for a young artist to learn her or his craft. So I want to wrap this up, but Ringling Brothers shut down in 2017. They're coming back in 2023 without animals. Brief comment about that? Thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 there are many reasons, I think, why the Ringling show shut down. I mean, it's basically a late 19th, early 20th century institution. It moved by railroad. Yes. Um, I, I I did actually did a piece, and maybe we can link to that. I did a, I, I'm an occasional commentator on NPR, on All Things Considered, especially, and Weekend Edition. And, um, and I did a commentary when the circus closed in 17 about it. And I just, I, I understand a lot of the reasons. I, I think the animal rights activists were a, a contributing, but not precipitating factor. Okay. Um, and I just worry about where kids of all ages, as they say, but especially young kids yeah. will go, will go for um, wonder. Where are they going to find awe? Because mm -hmm. if you see a kid, if yeah. you look at a circus through a child's eyes, yeah. it's just, it's a wonderful world. Amazing. All right. So whiplash is the whiplash is the only, <laughs> you know, concept I can do going from the circus and being a goofball and a clown, literally a clown to working for the opera and the Washington Performing Arts uh, <laughs> Society. So talk about that. How was that journey? And did you come to this area in particular, you know, on purpose? It did come here on purpose, but <laughs> wait a minute, there's a lot in between and to run it down very quickly. So I had to decide after I left the circus because as the audience of your viewers know right now, I mean, I like to talk and I was a pantomime comedian. I wanted to do something else uh, and I like to write. Yeah. So I decided to move to New York. Uh, Los Angeles didn't particularly appeal to me. And uh, I, I had an offer of a job in Chicago that then went away in San Francisco, but it turned out to be great because within a year I had met the woman I married, yes. who was also from Dayton, Ohio, and we didn't know each other back then. So and who's a performer really, also. She's an opera singer. She had That's gone to New crazy. York to study voice. So um, what happened? So I learned about opera <laughs> and um, just by hanging out. Yeah. But I had always liked opera and knew a bit about opera. Um, and I started to make my living in the theater. I worked in politics. I was a, at first I worked uh, as a news writer at WINS, the all news station in New York City. Mm -hmm. And then I worked as a speech writer and deputy press secretary for the Democrats in the New York State Assembly. And that was my day gig. Um, and what happened was I did performing, but more and more writing on the, in my own time. Right. And one of my projects became a musical called Ain't Misbehavin', which we're gonna won, get to that. We're gonna get mo to that. moved to Broadway, went to the Tony, won the Tony yeah. Award, et cetera. So then I quit my job. Yes. I was a director, a lyricist, a playwright for the next few years. But my wife and I had three kids. Yep. 
still trying to figure out how that happened. But in any case, um, <laughs> we're not going to cover that. We, no, 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 please Sorry. Just use your imagination. But the the um, so I was looking around for a job and I got offered the job um, as the assistant director of the opera musical theater program, as yes. it was known then yes. at the National Endowment for the Arts. So it was very purposeful yes. for me because I, I then entered the world of arts administration yes. and went from there to NPR, where I worked for about 14 years and from NPR to the op. Uh, no, to the AFI Silver Theater, which is where well, you and I met. We're going to we're going to get to that Spring. too. I and have so, as, no, no, no. But as you, you said, it's, so it's not quite the whiplash. It's not that you quite. Mentioned. OK. All right. Then, yeah, because then then I went to the opera for a, a very short time as a fundraiser. Yes. And then Washington Performing Arts. We've rebranded. There's no more society. OK. And, uh, and so I'm still. Uh, so now in my old age, I have two part time jobs. I have I'm the host of WAMU's The Big Broadcast, Big Broadcast on Sunday nights. Yep. And I'm artist in residence at Washington Performing Arts doing shows for them. And I'm still writing plays and doing songs and I'm, I couldn't be happier. It's great. All right. Well, I am going to take a prerogative before we head to Broadway. Um, wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me is just one of the best hours on radio. <laughs> sorry. Big Broadcast is not, I'm not quite the right demographic. I beg your pardon. I'm sorry. You're um, right in the demographic graphic. But it's argument. you, but it's you. So that makes it awesome. But um, <laughs> but wait, wait, don't tell me. It's so damn funny. And yeah. luckily, uh, WAMU plays it twice each uh, each weekend. So on Saturday and Sunday, and I think they even replay. But, um, but it is must listen radio. So you launched it. Talk about how you came up with the, that idea and how you think it is now, how it's evolved and, and what you think of it. Oh, oh, it's great. I agree with you. It's appointment listening. It's still wonderful. Um, and uh, it's really a refuge for people. Um, it's, uh, I, I, you know, I've worked also helped work on launch the Mark Twain Prize in American Humor. And this year, 2022, it was given to John Stewart. And I was there and so much was made of the fact that the Daily Show under John Stewart was really uh, uh, the newscast for a lot of people. It's how people got their news. Yeah. With wait, wait, don't tell me. The same is is really true for a lot of listeners. Um, it's not a long story. Um, I was in charge of cultural programming at at uh, NPR, mm -hmm. uh, which meant everything that's not news. I meant right. all the classical music, the jazz, the occasional folk music, radio drama, which we were still doing back then. Um, comedy and we weren't doing enough comedy and I wanted to do some comedy uh it was it was an uphill fight hmm. people at NPR did not want to do comedy um but it seemed to me that a game show would be I mean the, the our biggest comic expression at that time were uh Tom and Ray Maliazzi the car talk brothers right. right and they have a they had a, a brilliant radio producer uh a young guy uh, Doug Berman and um, benevolent overlord, benevolent overlord now, yeah. but of, of wait, wait, don't tell me, but okay. also uh, bongo boy, not a slave to fashion. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and um, <laughs> cause he does do drum circles and things like that. He went, he yeah. went to, he went to Wesleyan university where one of my kids went and, yeah. um, and they have a big world music program. Anyway, um, I, I, I had it in mind maybe to do a um, some kind of game show quiz show. I really wanted to do a revival of uh, College Bowl, which had been the GE program during the 1950s, where colleges would compete with one another. Yes. Um, but I I knew I couldn't do it myself. I was running a division, and I probably wasn't the best radio producer to do it. Um, and I managed to talk Dougie into into producing. So the, the shorthand way of saying it is, yes. Um, wait, wait, don't tell me is on the air because of me, but Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me is a hit because of Doug. I mean, okay. Doug still has a lot to do with the sound and tenor of that show. And um, it's one of the few examples I can think of where I was really an effective arts administrator. That is to say, my job was to create the conditions where other people could be creative, okay. as well as doing some creative stuff myself. Okay. And there were a lot of things in the early days that, you know, I wasn't crazy about that my chief lieutenant the wonderful Andy Trudeau 
wasn't crazy about. We said, look, they know what they're doing. Yes. They're a little bit younger. It's a little edgier. Yeah. Let them go. Yeah. And we did. And they and they made this huge, giant success out of it. And so it just, I've been able to go to two taping uh, tapings, mm-hmm. maybe three. Uh, yeah, so fun. Love the show. Okay, let's go. To- By the way, the, 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 the fact that you use the verb taping or yeah. the word taping yes. shows that you're in the exact demographic. For okay. The- <laughs> okay. <laughs> we As use it all the time. To recording? We- yeah, because oh. nobody uses tape anymore. But but okay. but okay. Uh, but we we always say tape. Where I'm okay. teasing you. Okay. All right. So you may not know this about me, but in when I was in college, I had a radio show, and it was Curtain Whoa. Call with Cheryl Kagan, and it was Broadway uh, musicals. So we oh, great. Off Broadway here. So first off, um, before we go to you uh, and and all that you've accomplished. Uh, you gave Lynn manuel Miranda his first rhyming dictionary when he <laughs> was working on his senior thesis at Wesleyan on In the Heights. Which yeah, yeah. I just have to say, In the Heights, and I have still never seen Hamilton because I'm not a multi-trillionaire. And, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I saw In the Heights in the joint production that was uh, performed at Olney Theater, and I took a friend, and after every number, literally after every number, we turned to each other and like jaws right. dropped. Oh yeah. my God. It was, yeah. I loved it. And I saw the, the movie wasn't the same. Wasn't the same. I mean, I well, really one, loved one's the a movie and one's, Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. I, 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 so I talk like the about movie Lynn well, Miranda and tell me, are you in touch? And I assume you've yeah. seen Hamilton a bunch of times probably. And like, talk about all that and him. I think, no, we only saw we saw Hamilton the week it opened. I guess okay. the, the the third or fourth performance. Um, oh no, no, we saw it twice. We saw it when it was at the Shakespeare Festival. We saw it at the Public Theater off Broadway, and then we saw it on Broadway. But that was the last time we saw it. Um, so it was 2015. Uh, I mentioned Wesleyan University, and I mentioned yes. my son, I, uh, the yeah. eldest of of three children that we have. Yeah. Um, and he's a filmmaker. And by the way, if you haven't seen Hamilton yet, you can just, if you can find I it, have. You, can, I have. you can you can watch my son's film called Hamilton's America, which I think still holds the record for the biggest audience of any great PBS great performances that ever was. Yeah. Um, so Alexander's best friend, my, our son Alex, his best friend was Lin-Manuel Miranda. No and uh, I'll tell you a great story. So they were in the same improv comedy troupe. Hey, notice, note to viewers, this is going to be a four hour podcast. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to love this story. Ahead, so, <laughs> so because she was a performer and because I was a performer, uh, Alexander invited us to the rehearsal that it was parents weekend at Wesley and it was probably sophomore year, their sophomore year. And uh we go there, we meet everybody in the troupe, which is called Desperate Measures. And uh, he's, oh, and this is my friend, Lynn. And oh, how you doing? And so Lisa, my wife went off to sort of talking to Lynn and I was talking to a couple of the other kids and they, ah, oh, time to go, time to rehearse. And they all made their way to the stage. And Lisa came over to me like this, Cheryl. She was like, Murray, I don't know what it is, but that kid's got it. He is right. I mean, this was after a, you know, one and a half minute conversation. Wow. None like a 19 year old or a 20 year old. Yeah. None of this success could have happened to a nicer person. He Uh, is great. He's a wonderful uh, guy. He's generous. He's generous of spirit. He's just a bundle of joy. Um, Actually, Alex and his family and his wife and two kids and Lynn and his wife, Vanessa, and two kids live about three blocks apart right now. And so they, I just, he just sent us some photos of a play date of his kids and Lynn's kids. Nice. So we're like, but anyway, what happened was he asked me, and I guess it was his senior year. We were all having brunch and he said, would you listen to my show? I said, sure. And we went back to his room. They were roommates and, and in a house, there were four of them. And we went back to his room and he started playing some of the then score for the incipient in the Heights. And, uh, and I noticed that a lot of his stuff didn't rhyme. It was imperfect rhymes. People call them off rhymes, slant right. rhymes, near yeah. rhymes. And you can get away with that in, in, um, in pop music. And you can certainly get away with it. It's, it's cherished in, in hip hop. Um, and it's a hip hop score, but in the theater, the audience really relies on rhyme to make sense of what goes by. Um, Stephen Sondheim has written about this. You know, he says, you know, everything's going by so fast. They don't know that you just said 
baby. But then when you rhyme maybe, they go, oh, that, that word was baby. I mean, it's, uh -huh. it's a very subtle thing, but uh -huh. that's what happens. And I said, listen, man, rhyme is your friend. Right. You need rhyme. And I went to the Wesleyan bookstore and thank goodness they had uh, wow. Clement Moore's uh, uh, famous uh, um, rhyme. Is it Clement Moore? Um, yeah. No. What's his name? Anyway, uh, his rhyming dictionary, the one we all use, and um, gave it to him. And I forgot all about it. And at the premiere of Alex's film, uh, this huge audience, and this is something very few people do in our business, Cheryl. He said, well, Alex was my connect first connection to real Broadway theater. His dad, who's here tonight, Murray Horwitz, he wrote Aww. Eight Was over there. And it was just like, nobody does that. Oh, my Aww. God. And he said he bought me my first rhyming dictionary. And I was like, thank God I had the wit to buy this guy. His That's first rhyming amazing. Dictionary. But, That's but awesome. he's got better. He had far better. Men and he said he was my first mentor. He's moved on to far better mem That's mentors. Amazing. I mean, he's worked with Steve Sondheim. He worked with... Uh, 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 John Kander, I mean, he's, you know, he's yeah, Kander knows stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's go to Ain't Misbehaving. Talk about, talk about the trajectory of how you, how you plucked that up and, and sold it. Many and of the Tony <laughs> Award winning, per, you know, production. Yeah, yeah. So I, I had done a one man show of stories of Shalom Aleichem, the yes. Yiddish short story writer on yes. whose stories Fiddler on the Roof was based. Yes. And the guy who directed that at the Manhattan Theater Club was Richard Walby Jr. I had no idea that Richard knew about musicals and was a gifted, lyric, famous lyricist in a way, uh, and a protege of Steve Sondheim. And um, I told him about this dream I because most of the great stuff that's happened in my life can be traced to a library of some sort. Uh, and this was the Dayton Public Library. We used to ra raid the records bin. Nice. And I was a big jazz fan from the time I was about 10 years old and discovered mm -hmm. Jelly Roll Morton. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took out a Fats Waller record and took it home and changed my life. I mean, it was the music I'd been searching for for all of my then 18 or 19 years. And um, so I always dreamed of doing something with Fats on stage because I, I couldn't believe that not everybody in the world knew who this guy was. I mean, he's one of the greatest entertainers of all time, one of the greatest popular song composers of all time, one of the greatest pianists of all time, just right. on many levels. Yes. And it occurred to me that not so much a movie, but something on stage would work. And I mentioned this to Richard. Richard was not interested. I don't like jazz. You know, I'm OK. And then I saw an evening of his own songs that Richard had done in the cabaret at the Manhattan Theater Club where we'd done Shalom Aleichem. Mm -hmm. And it's, it went on to become a successful show called Starting Here, Starting Now of his songs with David Shire. And that's when I grabbed him. I said, Richard, Fats, Waller. He said, well, maybe you should play me some. So I put together a little tape, just about five tunes, mostly tape. instrumentals. Tape, tape. You know, a cassette tape. Cassette tape, yeah. okay. And Richard heard what I heard, what everybody hears when they, the, yes. you know, the wit, the joy, the, the depth of, of Fats Waller's work. And um, a couple years later, they, Lynn Meadow, the head of the Manhattan Theater Club, was a little desperate for a cabaret show. And she said, uh, what about that idea Murray had? You know what? Maybe you two could do that. And that's the short version. I came down here to the Library of Congress and got permission from music publishers to Xerox a lot of lost tunes. Wow. And we it was whatever the opposite of a perfect storm is like a perfect sunny day uh -huh. that's what we had because we got in short order our collaborators became um the choreographer arthur faria the musical director luther henderson who is an nea jazz master who also used to do arrangements National for richard rogers NEA. And, yeah mm -hmm. yeah and, and who also used to do dance arrangements for richard rogers for rogers and hammerstein so yeah. he had one foot in both camps jazz and mm -hmm. theater mm -hmm. um vocal arranger bill elliott just it was it was a perfect collaboration and we opened in that same cabaret at the manhattan theater club and <laughs> come to think of it that was the same look on lisa's face we we invited an audience to the last dress rehearsal and when we got to intermission I'm taking notes furiously. Yeah. Richard's taking notes furiously. We get up from our little cabaret table. I turned around. I looked at Lisa who was sitting across the, the back wall saying, oh, this was wrong. That was wrong. And Lisa looked at me and went, oh, this, oh. this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. You know, so and she was right. I was wrong. Oh, my God. That's awesome. So, as Richard likes to say, we went into pre-production in uh, the first week of December 
1977. We went into rehearsal the first week of January 78. We opened the first week of February. We closed the first week of March. We went into rehearsal for Broadway the first week of April. We opened on Broadway at the Long Acre Theater the first week of May, and we won the Tony the first week of June. Oh, and we right. figured, oh, that's the way it works. That's how you do a Broadway <laughs> show. <laughs> no, man, it's never been like that again. Yeah, it's yeah, true. yeah. I mean, it took Lynn like seven years to get in the Heights on stage, something like that. Wow, wow. And it took him almost as long, it took him, yeah, it took him seven years to get Hamilton. So, mm. you know. Um, so let's talk about Broadway today or Broadway recent years, pre-COVID, COVID, and now. Um, yeah. Talk about what you see in terms of the quality, the diversity, um, like talk, talk about that first and then we'll talk about the impact of COVID. Yeah, well, the, the good news is actually has to do with the impact of COVID. I went to see two Broadway shows on a Saturday in November during the kind of lull in the at the end of 2021. Yeah. And I have to tell you, I've never been more comfortable than during this pandemic than I have been in a Broadway theater or in one of our own theaters. You know, we do shows now at Washington Performing Arts. You've got to show your vaccination at the door you and your ID, you know, you've got to wear a mask. On Broadway, the, the ushers were patrolling the aisles during the show, making sure you had your mask pulled up over nice. your nose. I felt very, very, very safe there. So yeah. it's still a kind of safe refuge. Mm -hmm. um, the quality has changed in many ways, some for the better, um, some, look, they're reaching big audiences. Who am I to say it's not great? I just, um, the old, 30, 40 years ago, people were saying that Broadway had turned into a kind of uh, um, theme park, you know, mm. that in, the, in, in, the, in, in addition to the, you know, every theme park has its rides, you know, Splash Mountain or Ma Magic Mountain or this or that. Yeah. And uh, so now the theme park has, you know, it's Lion King ride and it's got its, you know, Shrek ride and it's got it. Right. And um the theatrical lasting value of these things? I mean, I don't know, but is it a bad thing? Is Are they hurting anybody? No. Right. And, right. you know, there are kids walking around today who are the age that you and I were when we first fell in love with musical theater yeah. who are singing the score to uh, Lion King or singing the score to, you know, Aladdin or, Shrek, right. you know, and, right. and, and, it, and it's fine for them. So, okay, um, technically and technologically, things have changed in many ways for the better. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the use of projections in set design and, and, and the way things are light and, you know, computer programmed lighting instruments. I mean, yes. it's just, you know, just taken it into a whole new realm. That's just yeah. really wonderful yeah. and given us a lot more flexibility with what we can do. Right. Um, so that's where I am. I mean, I still love going to the theater. Yeah. Uh Let's pivot and talk about the big broadcast. So if okay. someone's never heard of it, uh, tell, like, why should they check it out? Well, that's, thank you. That's a very good way of, of answering, of, of asking the question, because the answer is, so the big broadcast is a show four hours every Sunday night on WAMU 88.5, also streaming at WAMU.org. Yes. And you can always get a few of the last few shows there. And it's an old time radio show. It is some classics of the golden age of radio, which roughly lasted for 20 years from the late 1920s to the late 1940s with some of the best programming though, coming later in the 1950s yes. uh, and early sixties with the introduction of audio tape, um, which made it possible to do a perfect show with no mistakes. Cause before then it was all live. Why to listen to it is this was a great art form that flourished only for about 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And you don't think anything about going to the theater like the AFI Silver and watching a movie from 1947. Why would you not, or, or 1939, God knows. And, 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 and why would you not listen to an Orson Welles radio show from 1939 when Welles himself said he did his best work in radio? So there's wonderful comedy, there's wonderful drama, there's great music. And uh, we try to play the range of it on the big broadcast. And it's, it's, I should point out, I'm the third host, the third permanent host. The show um, 
started it about 55 years. The show started in, I think, 1965 or 66. And um, uh, John Hickman and been, started it. And you've been so, on it since 2016. Six, yep, exactly yeah. so. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. So each of the first two guys lasted for different re health reasons for 25 years each. Wow. So if I got it in 2016, I told my kids to look forward to 2041. That's going to be a really good, good year for them. <laughs> there you go. Um, while we're on NPR and WAMU, talk about Pledge Week. It's one of the things you get to do or have to do. Uh, yeah, no. Fun, annoying. Like, what is that? No, I love it. I lo okay. love it for, for two reasons. First of all, it's live radio. Right. Yeah, right. So it's not pre-taped. So it's very spontaneous. Yeah. And you and and you, you when you tune in to a, a, a pledge drive uh, or a membership campaign, as we call them, yeah. um, you're really hearing the personalities of my colleagues of Tamika Smith and Jerry Mitchell and Jonathan Wilson and Esther Chamakili and all yeah. the people who are pitching. Yeah. Um, and second, it's I mean, if we are to put the worst face on it, salespeople, right. we're, we're, we've got the secret of say, because we're doing something we really believe in. We're selling something that we really believe in and it's good. Um, but from my, from my perspective from on my show, it's great because we have to do these pledge breaks of five minutes, six minutes, occasionally seven minutes, sometimes three minutes, two minutes. And as a result, we we get to play a lot of little things that we don't often get to play, you know, some 15 minute shows. And there were some great 15 minute shows in old time radio, right. uh, little snippets of masters like Gene Shepard, a great improvisational comedian from New York in the 1960s. Um, and so it's it, I really have a lot of enthusiasm for, for those weeks. Great. They're great. Yeah. So, um, so Murray, we're going to start uh, moving towards um, the fast five. Uh, uh oh. When you think about your legacy, um, it's assuming that I can think about my memory, no, yeah. <laughs> so you have left such a rich variety and such an enormous impact on the arts and humanities. We have to talk about AFI uh, in Silver Spring, uh, AFI Silver Theater. Uh, you founded it. You were CEO. You were there for. Uh, from 2002 to 2009, which, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. is when I first uh, had the great joy of knowing you and uh, and collaborating a little bit with you when I was running a foundation. Um, talk about talk about how that got launched, the challenges, and and how you think it's going. What what do you think it does for the community and the and the oh culture? boy, wow! How's that it, for 34 it, questions all at once? Yeah, no, no, this is that's not the fast five. This will take us. It'll take me a second, but. <laughs> Um, cause you asked several questions. Yes, the did. way I got the job was, um, they were desperate. They, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. Uh, I was looking for, I was looking around yeah. because they were, and NPR had decided to eliminate cultural programming. There are some few vestiges of mm -hmm. it left. Uh, actually our classical music show performance today is still done and distributed but it's being done out in minnesota and it's distributed mm -hmm. by a different network lee but, michael dempsey the folk music that went yeah, away well that was that's that's not an npr that was no, WAMU, that's that's a local no, show fair, fair. but but yeah a lot of the music programs went away and so i i they were getting rid of my one of my last acts at npr was the you know, lay off my whole staff. It was one of the worst days of my life. Mm -hmm. But most of them ended up getting jobs in public radio. A lot of them right stayed at NPR. I was looking around because there was, I would have been an on-air arts reporter. They were looking at me to do that. And um, I found out that, um, that actually they found me um, behind the scenes. This was unknown to me. I was at a Christmas party, an NPR Christmas party. Cokie Roberts came up to me and said, I know. I said, well, you know everything. You're Cokie Roberts. What do you mean? I said, you know, I know about Silver Spring. And I said, Silver Spring, AFI. And I was like, oh, that theater there. But yeah. And I, oh, my God, I wasn't supposed to say anything. And I said, so much for the tight-lipped Washington insider. Right, right. Tell me about that. Well, it turns out that Cokie Roberts was friends with Gene Furstenberg, the woman who ran AFI at the time. And somebody had recommended me to Gene. And when Gene heard NPR, she immediately called Cokie. Koki, thank goodness, had a lapse of taste and said nice things about Aww. me. And they took me to dinner in Bethesda, she and her associate. And um, uh, they offered me the job. And Amazing. that would have been. And so I, I had some loose ends to tie up. That would have been at the end of 2001. I said it was a Christmas party. And then um, I was another five months or so or six months at mm -hmm. uh, 
at NPR, and then I started in, in July at AFI. And that dovetails into another answer of your, what it meant to the community was, um, I mean, we'd had people come up to us on the street when I say us, my colleague whom you know very well, Ray Berry, and they'd yep. say, thank you, thank you, because this white elephant had stood there on Colesville yes. Road for something yes. like a dozen years. Mm. Uh, I had gone to a show at, 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 at you know, I, I think I saw The Godfather Part Two at the Silver in the in the early 70s mm. or mid 70s. And um, it, had, it had lain there. It was just awful. And it was kind of an emblem of what had happened to downtown Silver Spring, which was right. never awful, that awful. But it just the perception was terrible. Yeah. And when we came back that there was a definite, definite connection with Discoveries yes. building its headquarters there at the time, yes. uh, because we were there and they wanted to do a documentary festival with us. And we said, sure. Um, and one of the greatest public servants I've ever had the pleasure of working with, Douglas Duncan, Doug Duncan. I mean, he just yep. had a vision. He knew what he wanted to have happen. He had energy behind it. And, and we tried to do, to, to merit his faith in us. And, uh, but I remember opening night, when that was an opening night, it was opening week. We had partnered with Howard University and um, we were giving an award and uh, the Paul Robeson Award actually. Mm. And one of the, the, they did giving it that year to Harry Belafonte and, and Harry he and I- He was finally being inducted into the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It was just announced. <laughs> I'm fully expecting myself to be inducted in the, to put it, I mean, Harry, rock and roll, okay. Anyway, um, I was just listening to his brilliant recording of Try to Remember um, mm. last night. But Fantastic. Harry Belafonte is one of the saints walking the earth. I mean, it's hard to put into words how much he means just his being around. Yeah. And, um, and we had worked together a couple of times. And so I said, come on, let's go to dinner. So he took him to dinner at Cubano's, in fact. And it was uh -huh. very nice. It was a okay, springtime day. And there were these, there was a group of women, clearly from an office or something, having their office dinner, um, sitting on the patio outside Cubano's. And we walk up, Mr. Belafonte and I, and this woman leaps from her chair and says, <laughs> Harry Belafonte in Silver Spring, Aww. right? And it was it was like, who would have thought that such a thing could ever happen? And I, I told the woman, I said, get used to it because there'll be more, you know? Wow. Were, so wow. It, 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 it's meant a lot. And it was um, any, t I think of, our, I mean, you're a woman who has lived your life in public service. I have always thought of art as public service. If you're yeah. living your life right, the arts are a form of public service. And when you can combine, you yeah. know, civic progress with, you know, artistic excellence, which is what we were, I would like to think, able to do at the yes. Silver, uh, and that they still do at the AFI Silver, um, then that then that's a real point of pride. Yeah, no, we, that, that we, that's a good one. It's an amazing, um, I've been blessed to be invited and included in evenings with the director or with some key cast members. And uh, yeah, um, I, it's really special to be able to engage. And what were you thinking when you chose this yeah. Uh, or why did you keep in that scene that was so disturbing or whatever the whatever it was yeah and i i can say this because i haven't worked at afi for you know a dozen years but um and and the the, the shots are called by afi in los angeles but the silver what is now silver docks and there's not going to be a silver docks this year i understand mm -hmm. but what was uh, Silver Docks, uh, this documentary festival, was a big hit and be and grew very quickly because yeah. it was a hit with the artists, with the filmmakers, mm. be because, and they loved it. They said, you know, man, this is not Sundance. This isn't Telluride. This isn't Berlin. This isn't Toronto. This is, we're in Silver Spring, uh, you know, we get yeah. to mix with the people. Yeah. It's real. And yeah. it's, and, and as soon as they came in and made that you know, they dispersed the festival around DC. I think they lost that. I think mm -hmm. it had a lot to do with the civic spirit of Silver Spring. Nice, nice. All right, well, Murray Horowitz, such <laughs> a treat. So I have to tell you, I started this podcast now quite a while ago. This is about my hundredth episode. You have been <gasps> on my list from the very beginning, <laughs> the would love to interview someday. So I'm so thrilled to be able to do this. Right. So Murray Thank Horowitz. You. 
As uh, long as I wasn't pushed aside by like an Uber driver you had or something <laughs> like that, you know, it's like, yeah, folks okay. like the Senate president or the super ah, state superintendent of education, like folks like amateurs, that. rookies, yeah. were they funny? That's what I want to know. They were, they were <laughs> brilliant, but you're funny and brilliant. So, it yeah, no, thanks. Um, so Murray Horowitz, your fast five, five quick questions, quick answers to, uh, to let folks know more about you. I know. Okay. So number one, uh, what is your proudest accomplishment? Or I'll even ask, what award or recognition are you proudest? Oh of? my gosh! Um, the, I've ain't misbehaving is a signature piece in my mind and soul and heart because I was able to bring with my collaborators, and that's the other. Excuse me, important point. Anything I've been able to accomplish, it's always been done with collaborators. I've had the best collaborators. And that's that's really important for people to understand because the media always look at, well, who's the guy? Who's the one person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's rarely is it one person. Right. Um, and with collaborators, we were able to bring Fats, to exhume Fats Waller, who had yeah. been basically forgotten for about 25 years. And now people know who he is. I mean, you wouldn't think of doing a history of jazz or a history of comedy really without without Fats Waller. Uh, and that award, the Tony, yes, because they didn't have a physical Tony award for a lot, but they changed the rules and it didn't just go to the producer. It would go to the authors now. Yeah. And so I got the Tony award really relatively recently, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago. And just to see it on my piano, it's, in, nice. it's tastefully put aside, you know, but nice. it's like, yeah, damn. You I know. did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. awesome. And, and to, to think, if you work in the theater, to think that something you did yeah. You know, staying up at three o'clock in the morning, writing a joke and who knew it'd be funny or not. And that people are still doing it 45 years later. Yes. I mean, that's, I mean, it's not very few people get to do that. And yeah. so that's, 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 I'm getting chills. Cause that's, you're blessed. You're really, really blessed if that that's happens. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. So I, question two was going to be, what's your favorite Broadway musical? And you can't say, <laughs> you can't say it misbehaving. So I'm going to ask you what your top five favorite are. Oh, thanks. I, that's better. That's yeah. better. So that's as better. I was, so I have a list and it's like, oh yeah. And that one. Oh, and that one. And so yeah. I'm curious, I want to know whether we have overlap. So give me your fast, your, your five. Oh boy. Um, I, first of all, I haven't seen all that many musicals in the last, you know, 20 Doesn't years. Cause been down there. but no, no. Uh, you won't be surprised. Everybody answers for their own generation, you know, and so I, So these are things that kind of precede me. Um, Guys and Dolls, Kiss Me Kate. There is a musical that I grew up on and memorized and wore the grooves out of the record. It's a Langston Hughes musical called Simply Heavenly. It's almost never done now. Um, Hamilton is certainly one of the greatest musicals I ever saw. And uh, oh, I can't say it, misbehaving. So um, uh, did I say Kiss Me Kate? Is it Guys yes. and Dolls Kiss, kiss yes. Me Kate? Heavenly, uh, Hamilton. Simply Heavenly, Hamilton. And I'm probably leaving something out. Al although, no, I can't say that one. I got one more. Um, I'll, you know, I, I'll go with, um, God, I love Fiddler. I love West Side Story. I love so many of those musicals. Right. Um, I'll say Fiddler. I'll say Fiddler. Okay. Or, or uh, it's a tie. Two Sheldon Harnick, Jerry Bach musicals. Fiddler and She Loves Me. Okay. All right. Zero overlap. Okay. Oh, great. Um, what is? What are yours? Come on. Oh, well, I've got 10 written down here. No kidding. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me. I will tell you a few. Uh, political person, I have to say, I love 1776. I oh, love good for you. Which I saw with Lynn down here at Ford's Theater. I saw it. I've seen it so many times. Uh, Big River, Roger Miller. Uh, wonderful. My Fair Lady, Avenue Q, uh, Joseph and His Amazing Technicolor Dream Coat, Jacques Brel's Alive and Well in Living Paris, like yeah, yeah, Camelot yeah, Cabaret, yeah. Oklahoma. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, very recently when they did they did um, the Adventure Avenue Theater. Q. Adventure Theater did a, a an adaptation for kids of Big River. They did a brilliant job. I saw it. I was crying, and they updated some of the slavery yeah, stuff. And, I thought it was brilliant. And so Michael Bobbitt Bob and Leon Seaman have been such extraordinary yeah, leaders yeah, for yeah, Adventure yeah, Theater, yeah, yeah. and I and I Bill loved that. And it was Michael who brought me in, and he asked me to look at the show, and which was very nice. And I met Bill Hauptman, who wrote the book for the first time, because one of my collaborators, John Lewis did the vocal arrangements and the dance arrangements. So I knew people on the musical staff, but I didn't know Bill and I just met him like, I don't know, five years ago, whenever it was. Did you ever Great see guy. the ASL version? 
The, no, no, I did not, but I know I've seen tapes of it or whatever. I saw it so, twice. Yeah. I saw yeah, it in yeah. New York and yeah. I saw it when it came to Washington yeah. and both times I burst into tears at the end. Oh my it's God. National Theater for the Deaf, right? I think it's National Theater for the Deaf. Who I'm performed sure. it? Yeah. I don't know if I remember, mm -hmm. but the but the um, the guy who played Jim, I think died of HIV, of AIDS uh. um, years later, but he was brilliant and it was an amazing production. Amazing. One of my all time you, very favorites. You, okay, you, wait. You hit, go ahead. All right. Question number three. Um, who has been one of the most who who, who has been your most significant mentor in your life? I got to give you two. Um, and, <laughs> I and I know, I, <laughs> well, I know every, everybody says mom and dad, but that's very true. I mean, because mom and dad, uh, you know, every I would do a high school play and everybody say, oh, man, you were brilliant and everything. And mom and dad be like, y you know, you did OK. But you, know, <laughs> you got to think about when. Uh, and um, so mom and dad, for sure. And my brothers. But um in the in the business, I, there are two. Um, <laughs> One there, is becoming two is becoming three. Is no, 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 no. I started with saying it was two, and it was two. Speaking of 1776, Howard De Silva, the uh -huh. who played Ben Franklin in the yes. original cast and in the movie, yes. be befriended me. Uh, he knew more about theater than anybody I've ever met before. <laughs> since he was, I could tell you stories of things, just the ways he mentored. And he was just he was just wonderful. I mean, Aww. Howard was great. And then in comedy writing, um, it, again, why should he take notice of me? But Herb Sargent, who was the king of comedy writers in New York City, he used to, he was a TV producer. He produced a series in the early 60s called That Was the Week That Was, the American version. Mm -hmm. He produced all Lily Tomlin's specials and Richard Pryor's specials on nice. NBC. Nice. Um, and he was the first head writer on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He had been Steve Allen's writer. He uh, then was the, the first head writer on, okay. Saturday Night, on Saturday Night Live in the I old I knew you were gonna get to Saturday Night Live. That's and so And okay. so Herb was, was wonderful to me. Okay, question four of our fast five that are not fast. <laughs> this is our <laughs> loping along slow this is five, yes? slowest fast five ever. <laughs> um, number four, Murray Horowitz. Um, e what would you choose if you could write the music for any book or movie? If you could be the lyricist for any book or movie? Oh my God. You mean that and hasn't I have been to made give credit to my interns and stuff for this, these questions. That question came from them. This, this is not fast because one wants to be thoughtful about this. Oh boy. Oh boy. Um, it's been done. It's been done, but it's one of the books I knew I would always have to read. Oh, you said movie too, didn't you? Yes. Uh, it's what I don't know. Uh, probably my favorite movie, <laughs> which is it, it, uh, Ruggles of Red Gap, uh, which stars Charles Lawton uh, and was directed, I think, by Leo McCary. Uh, it's a perfect movie. It's one of the great ensemble comedy casts of all time at, with Zazu Pitts and uh, um, just People. rolling young it's just great i would love to do and i think somebody's done that and the other one is a book that i've read during the pandemic because i knew i'd always have to read it and that's don quixote but man of la mancha, man of la mancha, you know, mancha exists yes, yes they've yes. done it and they did a good job it was joe darian's lyrics that's that's a beautiful movie too all right the fifth in my uh -oh. last in our fast five this one i'm ready for a fifth after this one go ahead <laughs> Uh, the question that I ask everyone, Murray Horowitz, uh, what is your hidden secret superpower? What is, <laughs> what is a skill or talent, something you're really good at that most folks can't do? Oh, that most folks can't do. Because what astonishes people is I love to fix things and I'm pretty handy around the house, but there are a lot of people who can do that. Um, Not a lot of people I know, but okay. A skill or, well, if you got something you need fixed, you can call me. Um, Consider yourself called. <laughs> a skill or talent that most people can't do. I speak Yiddish um, pretty well. I mean, I read and write it at like a third grade level. That's and, cool. And, and, and I love Yiddish. And, and I think that, you know, I mean, I guess that's that, 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 that's, that, that let, qualifies. Let's, let's if, that. I thought you were going to ask what's my secret. What's the secret of whatever little success I've had? And that astonishes people because that's being from Dayton, Ohio. You know, you walk in, you name Murray Horwitz, and they think immediately that you're bald and 80 and from Brooklyn, uh, none huh. of which I am. I, I have hopes of being all three. But um, and, and, and I think really being from Dayton and being from Southwest Ohio is, has informed almost everything I've ever done.
Amazing. Well, what a beautiful way to end up. Uh, Murray Horowitz, this has been such a treat for the me. The pleasure Thank is all mine. Thank you so much for taking the time to give it this afternoon. I look forward to Thank seeing you, you in person before too long. You bet. Thanks so much, Cheryl. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.